Hello and a warm welcome to the CNBC Africa special in the collaboration <coughs> with Philips. My name is Gugule Tutele and we come to you from the sidelines of the World Economic Forum which is currently taking place here in the city of Durban. Today's topic over the next 30 minutes will revolve around the transformation of the healthcare sector on the African continent. Now more than ever, technology has certainly enabled us to ensure that there is increased inclusion in healthcare service delivery. But more importantly, how do we adapt to ensure that the data that we uh, receive from this technology is perfectly allocated to ensure that policymakers are empowered and, of course, healthcare service providers can enhance and improve their levels of facilities and uh, for service delivery? Well, to uh, unpack some of this, we have with me here in our studio Dr. Aaron Mutsualedi, who's the Minister of Health in the Republic of South Africa, followed by Jasper Westering, who is the CEO of Philips Africa. Siddharth Chatterjee, UN Resident Coordinator and UNDP Resident Representative. And last but not least, the female on the panel, Neka Mobison, who is the Founder and Chief Executive Officer of MDOC. Fantastic to have you all today and thank you so much for making time. A healthy conversation, no doubt, is what we're going to explore in the next 30 minutes. Minister, I'd like to start off with you by getting your open commentary and uh, review with regard to the rate of transformation that we see in healthcare services, not only on the continent, but obviously your area of expertise being South Africa. Just how far have we come in ensuring that appropriate transformation in healthcare service delivery takes place? I think as far as technology is concerned, we, we, we're somewhere there in, in comparison to the rest of the world. Where, where Africa is leaking very visibly is the financing of healthcare in terms of universal health coverage, covering every citizen in terms of healthcare financing. I think Africa is leaking far, far behind than most uh, continents of the world, and, and that's worrying. Is some one of the things that we need to do very, very fast. I'm sure you are aware that uh, United Nations uh, adopted the model of universal health coverage, a new healthcare financing system, in, in, in September 2015. In Africa, you can't count on five fingers. On, on, you know, you count about two or three countries, Ghana, Rwanda, that have some form of universal health coverage. In South Africa, it's still at the policy stages, and that worries me a lot. The second thing that I think must happen very fast as a game changer on the African continent is the issue of primary health care, especially through uh, community health workers. Because the issue of human resources for health is going to remain a big problem for South Africa for many decades to come. So a game changer, something that will happen very fast is the issue of community health workers on the continent. Okay. Ensuring primary health care as well as a financial inclusion. I want to pick up on the primary health care element and see what our peers across the continent have been doing through Philips. And yes, but just today, uh, an announcement uh, regarding a partnership between Philips as well as the health care government within Kenya to improve primary health care facilities. Again, highlighting what the Minister of South Africa has said regarding uh, uh, this imperative regarding primary health care. Give us an overview of uh, the partnership that you have in Kenya and uh, some of the examples as well uh, regarding your participation across the continent. Thank you. Well, I fully agree with the comments that are made. Um, if you look at sub-Saharan Africa, we know that roughly four out of 10 Africans actually do not have access to healthcare facilities or healthcare workers. Uh, we also know that the ones that do have access are sometimes or actually often confronted with poor quality and that can vary from the lack of electricity the lack of clean water to actually healthcare equipment being available. So what we've done together with the government of Kenya is already a long process where we've looked at how we can offer affordable community life centers uh, aimed, on uh, aimed on providing primary health care through all Kenyans. We've started, we've now made a next step where we announced a platform because we've realized that this is a complex challenge that you tackle. It is about accessibility in rural areas, it's about quality, it's indeed about tackling the issue of healthcare workers. So you can only tackle this if you really work together with government, private companies like ourselves and other stakeholders. And this platform is a next step to fact-based look together how we can make a really impactful step in primary healthcare, in this case in Kenya. So we're very happy with the initiative. 
I want to build up on that and uh, uh, perhaps uh, play with assumptions that we often hear in the African market that the continent is quite similar when we know in reality it's very different. Given that healthcare, some would assume healthcare is healthcare, people need to be fit, people need to be happy uh, and healthy. Are the models that you use and implement in markets like Kenya easy to replicate in other markets like South Africa, Namibia, uh, and across the continent in general? I'd like to start off with you, Jasper, and get your, your views on that, Sid. Absolutely. I think the models that we are actually building are based around modules, and that together with the stakeholders, governments, other parties, we can actually decide which modules we put together to build a primary healthcare center. And that can vary. We focus a lot on mother and child, mortality to improve that but you can add the modules as you go and as I was mentioning the element of electricity we also provide via solar electricity and in areas where vaccines are needed you could even use the electricity for a small refrigerator actually to keep the vaccines ready for use and that they don't get spoiled so it's modular and yes we can expand that quickly so I think Kenya has shown remarkable leadership I mean at the political level remarkable leadership because it's really leapfrog let's say, reduction of maternal mortality. Just a few years ago, Kenya had surpassed over 500 deaths per 100,000 live births. Now, that's a significant number. The MDG5 target, which Kenya missed, is about 170. But in a span of the last couple of years, they've actually brought it down to 366. And what we are seeing is a convergence of technology, political will, partnerships. And this platform that, that Jasper spoke about is a platform around the sustainable development goal number three. The government is leading on it, and what we want to see happen is the convergence of public, private, civil society, everybody coming together. I'll give you some facts. Six counties in Kenya contribute to 50% of the maternal deaths in Kenya. 50%. 50%. 15 counties to 98% of the maternal deaths. But that number has changed dramatically, and this was a convergence where the government of Kenya led. We had the United Nations Population Fund, the United Nations Children's Fund, WHO, which came together, six private sector companies joined us, and these are six of the most hard to reach, difficult, insecure counties in Kenya. In a matter of two and a half years, the maternal mortality rates have dropped significantly. And what we found that from the ecosystem of the global compact that you hear about in New York and elsewhere, this was a program that actually brought together into a fact based, project based, actionable uh, program sure. led by the government ownership by the county authorities so what we now want to see is go to scale throughout Kenya and as you've heard the Minister of Health of Kenya has been repeatedly saying in the next five years we want to achieve universal health coverage at the primary health care level mm -hmm. and this is where the public-private partnership will come in and if we succeed there it's not just a model that can be replicable in the rest of Africa but perhaps rest of the world. Exactly. I'm happy to hear this optimism regarding this common vision and goal that we have and clearly the public sector is speaking to the private sector and we are seeing an enabling environment being created. Neka, that takes me to you, uh, a skilled pediatrician who has worked in the private sector and become an innovator now with regard to uh, your uh, uh, digital platform being MDoc mobile doctor to ensure that healthcare services are available across the continent. What is it that you as an innovator and someone who has worked within the healthcare sector needed to ensure that that enabling environment and culture of innovation and creativity uh, was available for you to uh, establish MDOC and more importantly if those lessons and nuances can be implemented across the African continent and with initiatives that uh, government as well as uh, the private sector and foundations uh, have also highlighted. Thanks so much for the question. I mean I think I'll talk about why we even started MDOC, right? We saw gaps in healthcare systems across Africa. So before I started MDOC, I was leading work with focusing on quality improvement for an international NGO. And I saw that we were often defining, um, the, the narrative for healthcare on this continent was be, being defined a lot of times by external funding and not by us defining our own problems. And specifically, for us, our focus is chronic disease management, non-communicable diseases. We saw that we were experiencing, the continent was experiencing faster rates of premature mortality than anywhere else in the world, and we weren't even talking about it. So we said, okay, look, what do we need um, in terms of actually creating, leveraging the technology where we're seeing the advancements across the continent from a financial perspective and beyond to actually ensure that there's access to care um, regardless of who you are on the continent, initially focusing on Nigeria. We needed public health, public support, first and foremost, Sid talked about it. When you don't have political will, um, especially in this arena, 
you're not going to get too far. You can definitely leverage what's happening at the ground, leverage community support, leverage frontline workers. We've done that, we've shown that, but it only goes so far. And we design for scale at the outset. So when you design for scale at the outset, you work with your, 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 your public sector. Our, our, in Nigeria in particular, our Minister of Health is very focused on technology, really sees this as an opportunity for increasing access, and that's helped us. Second, it's working closely with the private sector. Um, we have multiple examples of where the private sector is really interested in innovation and working together and collaborating to ensure that we, uh, we uh, our Nigerians essentially have the access to the right type of care at the right time all the time. The, the other piece too is civil society, but always with the patient at the center. So we often forget, we talk about healthcare, but we don't talk about who is who are we doing this for? The patient at the center. So we've involved patients from the get-go, users in terms of designing our programs, hearing what their needs are. 16% of them in Nigeria, 16% of chronic disease patients told us, we don't have a primary care provider. We're talking about primary health care systems, but our people who are living with diabetes and hypertension and mental illness don't even have a primary care provider. They're actually bypassing the system to get care. Sure. So starting with them, working together with them, with the support of public and private sector has been pretty incredible, I have to say. Exactly. That's exactly what we want to hear, and clearly uh, finding a way going forward with regard to this. But I also want to pick up on a few themes that have come through uh, regarding the opening remarks that have been made by the minister that was uh, finance uh, and clearly we need finance for almost two things not only the bricks and mortar infrastructure development of healthcare facilities but also the technology that we need to uh, piggyback off uh, as an enabler are there some innovative models that have uh, been making their way through so let's start with you and minister I'd also like to get your feedback on um, options and um, developments that are taking place regarding uh, in improved See, that's precisely why models. we need the private sector here they bring the innovation they bring the technology they bring the intellectual capital onto this what the United Nations system provides is technical assistance. What the government provides is leadership. And what we found when I was mentioning these six counties to you, that how with the government leading partners like Philips, Merck, GlaxoSmithKline, Safaricom, Huawei, a Chinese company, really converged and said, yes, let's get results. But the planning of this platform is about a return of investment too. It's to look at over a period of time because you want sustainability. The minister talked about community health workers. You know what? Kenya needs a million jobs, new jobs a year, every year for the next 10 years. Africa needs 100 million new jobs. It's because of the youth bulge. That's the demographic dividend. Now, the healthcare, smart, savvy, young, technologically savvy community health workers are going to be transformational in the way primary healthcare will be delivered. And because Europe has a 3% shortage of doctors, Africa has a 50% shortage of doctors. We don't, we sh our preventative health system should be so robust that when you come up the chain, you have fewer patients coming up. Ah, precisely. Minister? You, are, you want to know about the innovations, the te technical innovations that we have. Yes, uh, <clears throat> the, we, we have got quite a number of innovations that have changed the situation in South Africa. For instance, for pregnant mothers, we, 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 have got, uh, we have got an innovation where all of them, uh, 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 which you call Mom Connect, by the way, where all pregnant women connect with us on the cell phone and we are able to communicate messages to them about their level of pregnancy and what they need to do. At the last count, we have already exceeded a million within the past, uh, uh, yes, a million pregnant women uh, who are connected on Mom Connect. And they also, we don't only give them messages, they also lodge complaints if they are not satisfied and, and, or compliments if they are. And guess what? Contrary to the belief which you usually see in the press, for every seven compliments, there's only one complaint. I'm saying contrary because in the press they'll tell you the public health sector is not, you know, it's not working very well, nobody likes it. But the pregnant women are saying we are happy, you know, seven times Versus more than we are complaint. unhappy. Yes, it, it helped us very much. We also have what you call a chronic medication program, whereby uh, we've got all the patients who are on chronic medication, especially ARVs, TB medication, etc., whereby they don't have to go to the clinics to collect that. It's, it's been delivered to them through that system to points where they choose. They choose themselves and say, me, if you deliver my medicine to such and such a place, I'll be able to walk there and collect it. 
we've already got uh, more than a million patients again on that as of March uh, this year. We also have got the mobile side through which we communicate with adolescents because they've got many questions and their parents are not able to answer them. At school, they are not able to answer. Where we can communicate with them about the present health care changes and their health needs, and they are very free to communicate through that Mobi site. Exactly. So clearly disruptive innovations taking place across the continent oh, and improving yes. access uh, for all uh, when it comes to this and public partner, uh, private partnerships, as you've mentioned, sit, uh, clearly at the center of this all and uh, being prioritized. What I want us to understand, though, is that a theme that often comes through in the World Economic Forum is the fourth industrial revolution, the digital age. And clearly we need a workforce that is prepared for this digital age, and we need a healthcare sector that is prepared for the digital age. Nick, I want to come to you. Given that you're a pediatrician, clearly you've earned your stripes as a doctor, as many of you has, have here on the panel too. Uh, but the space for innovation and disruption, what needs to change within our skill set from a medical uh, point of view on the continent to ensure that it opens up uh, uh, more elements of transformation? So I, I always like to highlight, I don't, think we, I don't think we talk about our innovations on this continent enough. I mean, truly there are innovations in service delivery process improvement, systems improvement that are happening that are actually at scale and that we need to take to the rest of the world. I just want to just highlight that first. But from an innovation perspective, if we really want to be ready for the fourth industrial revolution, um, we've got to invest. Let's start from technology. We've got to invest in capability building. So I'm an engineer. My first degree was in engineering. I'm a mechanical engineer and then went on to medicine. I did not think it was going to be so difficult to find developers, skilled developers that could essentially support us in building this complex platform that integrated with the healthcare systems that we're trying to support. I can't tell you how many times when we asked to find these developers, people pointed me to the same one organization. This is across Goodness. the continent. Highlighted the hubs. We have 300 innovation hubs across this continent right now. Are they working in a consolidated fashion? Are they working tied with research institutions? If we look at just research from its perspective and what's coming out of this continent, right now, Africa only contributes 1% to the total global research outputs. Of that, only 29% is STEM. That says it all to me, right? We are not investing in capability building in, in STEM on this continent. And so how, how are we going to be ready for the fourth industrial revolution? That's from the STEM side. Within that, let's talk about kind of the healthcare piece. We're really excited about community health workers. They're absolutely, they have changed the game across this continent. That said, because we're all excited about them, we're all putting the burden on them now. We're all going to, all of us are going to them and saying, how can we work together? So they're already becoming overburdened. Our healthcare, for, our healthcare workforce that's in the facility is already overburdened. So how can we think about task shifting, working with other folks in the community, as the Honorable Minister talked about kind of this decanting, working at the community, meeting people where they are, as opposed to having them come to the facility. So are there skills that we can invest in from a clinical and a medical side that support even volunteers at the community level and create, create kind of these, these groups that can support care at the, at the home and individual level as well. Very true. So even though technology is an enabler here, but the human element is still quite critical to ensure that there is that touch point at the end of the day. I'd like to come to you, Jasper, as well, just to get further details to build up on the commentary and feedback that's been provided by NECA. Not only the technology investments and ensuring that we open up the industry, but what is it that Philips has been doing to cultivate that culture of innovation, to cultivate uh, that uh, culture of in inclusion for many players within uh, the uh, healthcare sector? Well, I think we've realized that if you really want to offer primary health care, you indeed have to do that at a community level. And you can only do that if from the beginning you actually involve the community. So what we do as part of our primary health care setup is that actually we train the people in the community not only to take care of, let's say, the medical aspects, but also to take care of the facilities at their own. And I agree, if we don't do this, we will not find the resources. And I know you mentioned this morning in another session how many people we still need. So that is one lesson we learned, and that's why we talk about the partnership. It's a partnership with the government, with the private sector, but also with the communities we're in. And innovations can come in many shapes and forms. It can be relatively simple innovations. For instance, we know electricity is an issue, so we have something which we call a wind-up fetal Doppler. So it's a model that you can just generate electricity by hand, because we know this will work in rural settings. On the other hand, there are also many examples where in Africa, in South Africa, we do have high levels of innovation where remote monitoring, telemonitoring is playing a role. So I think we have actually both. 
We've on the one hand pockets where innovation is at a world-class level, but we also know that there are huge areas where we, where we have to start small. We need to bring this together, we need to get the people around this, and then we can make a step change. Exactly. I would just say there's a convergence of two things that needs to happen. If Africa has to take advantage of its youth bulge, its burgeoning population, we are going to be 2.1 billion by 2050. Kenya, for example, was 7 million in 1956, same as Sweden. Today, Sweden is 10 million, Kenya is 46 million. By 2030, Kenya will be 65 million. 2050, Kenya will be 85 million. To me, that's a huge opportunity. If I was the CEO of a company, I'll be looking at this potential market and saying, look, how can I impact this? Because if I have communities that are educated, that have skills and are healthy, that's the future uh, market for me. Exactly. And that is why investments now are going to matter. I'll give you a story of Unilever in India. 1908, Unilever set up its first factory. 1908, India was a colony of the British, broke, poor. Today, in a population of 1.4 billion, two out of three Indians uses a Unilever product. Makes so, sense. you know, it's, the, so I just think this is, the, this is not about, this is about a global good. And as John Dunn said, you know, no man is an island, every man is a piece of the continent. The private sector thrives, governments thrive, and finally for us as the UN, humanity thrives. Exactly. And that is the end goal and objective anyway, because that's our most critical uh, resource, being humans. I do want us to tie it into uh, governments. Uh, as you know, uh, recently on the African continent, the breakout of meningitis in Nigeria. Ebola was also a big threat a few years ago. Uh, things like malaria, uh, still uh, quite a, a serious issue. Even though this moves us away from the primary health care facilities, but when we have serious outbreaks of illnesses, uh, that needs involved transparency between governments and uh, ease of access to data. Uh, and quick uh, uh, medication in order to uh, ensure that many more lives can be saved. With the power that technology holds, with the power that transformation and data holds, what does this mean for governments of the future when it comes to healthcare facilities and communication with our neighbors across the continent to ensure that no healthcare threat will uh, see the eradication of human lives on the African continent. So clearly there are opportunities here, Minister. I'd just like to get your thoughts and overview regarding government policies in the future, seeing increased transparencies as we make use of efficient use of data and technology. Well, we, we are going to have to be very transparent in Africa. We are forced because now we have established as a response to Ebola, one of the things that happened is the establishment of the African CDC, which will sort of be a civilian center, but also a, a health intelligence center which must pick up what's happening all over the continent and, and process it and take action. And that's why I, I emphasize this issue, Google, of primary health care workers. Because without them, the CDC alone, even with technology, will not be able to detect what's happening in a household in a very, very far removed rural village, but primary health care workers can do that and feed it into the CDC and then we are able to know. In other words, we are able to diagnose not individuals, but to diagnose the whole continent and know what's happening. So, so that transparency is going to be important. Now where the weakness is on the African continent, we don't have data mm. at the moment. I don't think there's a single African country that has got a health care information system. In my own country in South Africa, we have got nine provinces. We discovered in 2010 that since democracy in South Africa, which is uh, 1994, the nine provincial departments of health spent 4.5 billion rands in acquiring health information technology, but we don't have any today sure. for the whole country. Each, each one, you know, you know how technology works. It can be very good, but it can also destroy you. Exactly. Yes. Because each province say, look, I'm working with this company, we put up this technology, they put it up. The other province put a different one, you know. When the politician leaves it, you know, is somebody convinced him that, no, 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 this is, this is poor. What you are put here is poor. I've got a better system for you, remove you, that, you know. So fortunately, we came together with the CSIR in South Africa for the past five years to work out on a technology system which will register all South Africans in one unique patient identifier. And we've already started that. We've covered 1,900 clinics. We've already registered 5 million South Africans. Every single South African is going to belong to that system from the cradle to the crave. That's going to be, in other words, 
regardless of which institution you go to, when they press the screen, they see your number there, they know where you have been, they know all your ailments, they know what you have. At the moment, people are moving from clinic to clinic in South Africa, by the way. With different collecting, files. No, collecting ARVs or medicines from one, one clinic to the other, hour per hour, day by day. Oh. Doctors are not able to know that this person collected next door an hour ago or just yesterday. With that unique patient identifier, that's going to happen. And then we then have to make the disease, I, 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 they must be reported. They must be notifiable. And you can only do that if you are open and you have got data. I am still not sure whether I will be very successful because I'm afraid to say there have been lots of things that were kept secret in Africa. In other words, I don't want the world to laugh at me, so I'm hiding that we have got such a problem. It's still happening a lot in, in Africa and it's scary. The second thing is to confuse fighting for disease with diplomacy. And that's another issue that Africa must solve. You know, the international health regulations exactly. about, uh, 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 for instance, yellow fever, etc. What What countries do on the continent which I don't like? Once they've got that, instead of realizing you've got to protect humanity, they said, no, but you, my brother, we've got good, good diplomatic relations. You're not going to stop me from entering your so country. So politics gets involved. It gets involved, and that's why the diseases will always kill us because. These diseases know nothing about diplomacy. Exactly. Yes. What I'll leave it at, Minister, as we do draw our closing our remarks, is the one element that you're certainly giving us as a takeaway to solve is political will. One element from the rest of our panelists, starting with you, Neka, Sid, and then Jasper, that we need to focus on, whether it be skills, whether it be innovation, to make sure, though, that by 2030, our sustainable development goals have been reached on the African continent. Neka? Yeah, I mean, I'll go back to capability building. I mean, I, we, we need to invest in that on the continent and across the spectrum, okay? So it's, it's, not just your, it's not just your clinicians who actually need the skills. We don't talk about it. We need to keep up their skills. Um, but it's also other folks in the workforce. It's our students, our youth of today. We're talking about fourth industrial revolution. We're not investing in them from a technology perspective, from an entrepreneurship, from a leadership and management perspective. They're not going to be the leaders that we need for the fourth industrial revolution to ensure that we have a healthy and happy, productive society. Exactly. Sid, very briefly. I I would say three P's, political will, policies, and partnership. And I'll just emphasize policies. If Singapore, can, and, uh, a cholera and malaria endemic country, has done away with it, I disagree that outbreaks are possible. Outbreaks can be prevented. Casper, we'll close it with you. And to me, it's partnership. Communities, governments, private companies working together. Technology is there, the solutions are there. If you really come together, focus on outcomes, we can make it work. Indeed. Cohesiveness is clearly what's uh, coming through as a strong theme here with the patient at the center of it all, as long as all parties have a common vision and goal. Thank you so much to my panelists for participating today. Starting to my right, a big thank you to the Minister of Healthcare in the Republic of South Africa, Dr. Aron Mutsualedi, followed by Jasper Westering, the CEO of Philips Africa, Siddharth Chatterjee, UN Resident Coordinator and UNDP Resident Representative, and Neka Mobison, founder and CEO of MDoc. Well, that's how we bring this special panel discussion to you to an end, the transformation of the healthcare uh, sector on the African continent. As you heard, through cohesiveness, through partnership, politics and policies, uh, clearly the common goal and objective can be met. From myself, Kukule Tutele and the team, it's goodbye for now. <laughs>